Hi, I'm Mason, and this is Kara, and we're the hosts of Expert Secrets Revealed Conversations in Health and Fitness, also known as the ESR Show, sponsored by Centrax Nutrition. It's a show built around exceptional people and ideas that educate, entertain, and inspire. And today's guest is Emma Doyle. And Emma is a world-renowned speaker and coach mm -hmm. from Melbourne, Australia, who specializes in helping people unleash their potential. And she's been coaching for over 28 years and basically has been a, like a touring tennis professional. And yeah. she has been a talent development coach and Australian Junior Fed Cup captain and coach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She specializes in helping people develop a high performance mindset and also develop their emotional intelligence both on and off the field. So we're super excited to have Emma with us today. Emma, welcome. Welcome, Emma. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it, Cara Mason. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I also know what it's like to run a po podcast, so it's great to be a guest on a podcast as well. So appreciate you both. Absolutely. Thanks so much for being here. So to, let's start off with, tell us what a high-performance mindset is. Really simply, I would say a high-performance mindset is really about the strength of your inner voice. So that's what it means to me. And it also is about bringing out your authentic voice because everyone's inner voice is different. But the interesting thing is, of course, that it's really influenced by the people who you surround yourself with and, of course, your coach. So the way that your coach speaks to you can become the strength of your inner voice. And I'm all about, I'm a coach myself. I'm uh, everyday learning and, and growing as a coach. So I love helping coaches how to coach because who you are is really what you repeatedly think. So it's really about the strength of that inner voice. And the really cool bit, which I'm sure you two will both agree, is that everyone can access a high-performance mindset. So that is that is a really really important thing just to kick off this podcast in letting it's it's accessible to all of us. And one other point that I'd love to just make around uh, that is the difference between training and competing. So somebody that has a high performance mindset, when you are competing, you are pushing and you are stretching the boundaries. You're always just going up a notch and seeing how much you can improve technically, tactically, whatever it might be in training. So that when you get into the battle of competition, a high performance mindset is someone that can play within their skill set on game day. That's really, really important. I work with a lot of clients who uh, believe that perfection is the answer and they, they want to play the way they do in training in a match. But one thing that I think is really important, just a subtle distinction that not many people think about, is how do you play within yourself when you're competing so you can do your job efficiently and effectively in the present moment? So being able to be still, trust your intuition, trust your body, especially in tennis, my sport of tennis, is really what a high-performance mindset is all about. Did that make sense? It does. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I know that you, you know, incorporate this in your training. So what are some of the examples that you have that it has built the confidence in athletes that you train? So, well, first of all, let's define confidence. Uh, okay. One of my mentors told me this when I was very, very, when I first started coaching and I'll never forget it. He said, Emma, confidence equals time plus experience. And I love, I love that formula because it allows us to develop our skills over time. And one thing about time, as I'm sure you know, especially Mason, all the, the Ironman training that you do, that quality time is really important. But Monday can't go any faster than Tuesday, which can't go any faster than Wednesday. So time is, is this element where we build our confidence over time. But here's the really cool part, part and cool part about being a coach is that you can short circuit the experience of others just by listening to this podcast, reading great books, uh, it, and short circuiting the experience of mentors. And of course, your coach can help you develop your skills and of course, your confidence over time. So there are a couple of things that just with regards to confidence. Now, in terms of how do we actually 
increase uh, our confidence through developing more of a high performance mindset. Let's go back to being in the present. So if I had to give out one tip, I was thinking about what's the most succinct thing that I could share. It would definitely be anchoring and affirmations. So an anchor is a, a physical trigger. So it might just be the thumb, the middle finger and the index finger. And when they touch together, It's a matter of now reminding me to fire off my affirmation to keep me in the present moment, such as I am present. That simple. I belong here. I believe in me. I am ready. Uh, It could be when we're a a certain part of the racket, the tennis racket might be just a finger down the throat of the racket, might be touching the dampener, uh, whatever it might be to help you be in that present moment so that you're ready for the heat of the battle, to be able to trust your skill set, uh, so that you can strengthen that that inner voice in the moment. Because obviously, as we know, most people are either ruminating on the past, missed opportunities, unforced errors, the easy ball that we missed in the net, or they're worried about the future. Uh, a friend of mine studied uh, 279 high-performance athletes, and the number one reason it was about um, failure, why, why top athletes fail, and the number one reason why they fail was actually fear of failure. So it hasn't even happened yet, but it's that that anxiety around the future. So I think in developing a high performance mindset, if I anchoring in affirmations is something I work with my clients on a daily daily basis. So just reinforcing that habitual pattern of being able to center yourself to be able to trust your body. You've already done your thinking about what you want to do on the next point. And I really love, I really love that strategy to help, you know, cement that high performance mindset to build your confidence over time. What are your thoughts on the the confidence formula, you two? Did you like that one? Well, I I love what you said. Yes. And it's and it's funny that you talk about that because mm-hmm. uh, I like I I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan and I've read his books and studied him. In fact, I bought a yeah. copy for for Cara and one of the things he talks about is is anchoring. He talks about getting yourself into a peak state and then providing a unique stimulus and then and then getting yourself into a peak state and providing unique stimulus, getting yourself into a peak emotional state and providing a unique state stimulus in that state, maybe confidence, you know, if that's the, if that's the state that you want to mm-hmm. be able to duplicate. And then all of a sudden, after you've done this multiple times, mm-hmm. you can provide that stimulus and it creates that that sense of, in this case, confidence, which you've anchored. Uh, right. I, and I was reading tennis is your thing, but I, I was reading um I can't remember when it was, but it was uh, it was one of Robin's books or articles where he was talking about some coaching he did with Andre Agassi when Andre was nowhere near the top of his game. Mm-hmm. And he talked about his body language during competition and what he was saying to himself, his self-talk and mm-hmm. and, you know, with some anchoring, but like what she's talking about, right. um, he walked onto the court and had this look about him mm-hmm. that w- to his opponents was like, why did you even bother showing up today? I got this. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but mm-hmm. what she's talking about here was a practical yes. application. So I this, love what you're saying. So do I. And I know it's it's long term too, and long term practicing of this is I think is super important because it's not just at that very moment, you know, that you need something. It just it goes on uh, for the lifetime, you know, of it. So, and what are your thoughts on that? I know that you implement that as well. A hundred percent. And it's not something as well that I believe in just giving your clients these skills. I mean, but right before I delivered my TEDx talk, which is called Unleashing Female Potential, I was firing off both anchors on both hands. And it was uh, simply head, heart and gut. I can do it. Head, heart and gut. I can do it. Breathing, confidence, breathe out, doubt. Right. I mean, this is something that you can use before an important meeting, before uh, in, in a conflict resolution conversation that you need to have. So just being able to, to be in state, which I love that word, Mason, that you use to describe what it is that we need to be able to uh, find each time that we have something important in our lives that we need to do. And it, it really doesn't matter whether you're in sport, you're in the workplace, most of us have to perform and we have to be in situations, even if it's delivering a team meeting. So being able to get yourself in state is by far one of the best techniques that I that I can share uh, to be able to, to build that confidence and, of course, strengthen that inner voice. 
Right. And, and, and that's another question that I had for you saying that with your techniques and you talked about breathing. Can you give us a couple of other examples that we can take home with us that you teach um, to the athletes that you run into on a daily basis? Yeah, sure. Uh, so many. Uh, let me see. One of the favorite ones at the moment, uh, I do a lot of work with teenagers and giving teenagers the um, the power to be creative and really tap into their creative side around game styles. So, for example, uh, you know, generally in tennis, there's five uh, game styles. For example, the all-court player, the aggressive baseliner, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of putting them into one of those five buckets, we, we explore, explore and experiment with different ways for them to feel unique, to feel like they're putting on armor. So one of my players, uh, he's a lefty and he's the shield warrior. You know, he does his shielding with his backhand and his, his forehand and his serve are his, his weapons and his sword uh, to be able to set up the points. We've got the curious lion. We've got the hunter game style. One of the girls that I worked with, she's, she calls herself the hawk. She just like waits, 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 and then she pounces. Um, so exploring different ways of allowing them to step into this armor. And so therefore self-esteem is not linked to their ranking. It's almost like, uh, you know, I, I choose to play tennis as a sport rather than I am a tennis player or where parents sometimes say, Oh, my, my oldest is this. And my, you know, the intelligent one, and this one's the, the, the sporty one. And so rather than, you know, and they have great intentions and I, I, you know, I'm all about embracing parents and parent education, uh, but how do we, how do we allow them to step into the, their creative uh, battle self and that image of, of what that looks like? So that's one technique. Another one that comes to mind uh, along the similar lines um, through a friend of mine from the UK, Hazel Gale, she, uh, she calls it mind, you know, your mind monster. We've all got a mind monster, you know, that, we're talking about the strength of the inner voice. Everyone's got that voice that says you're not good enough and the naysay your own naysayer voice, like, well, why you? What why should you be on this podcast with all these other fabulous uh sp speakers and guests that you have on? So uh giving your mind monster a a, a picture, draw it, drawing it, giving it a name. For example, some of my clients are we've got Gloria, uh uh the interestingly. The, the boy that I was talking about earlier, you know, the, the shield warrior, his mind monster is called the hollow knight, which is just so cool. Uh -huh. So he draws this knight. And then what we do is we work on, of course, what is the positive intention of the mind monster? So a lot of my clients, you know, a very perfectionist uh, type A personality, um, you know, managers of teams and corporations. And, and so, you know, we work on that, uh, because especially in the sport of tennis, for example, tennis does not reward perfection. It rewards rewards bravery. Like most things in life, it, perfection is 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 very very um, interesting. And uh, just quickly back to that study that I mentioned, um, my friend at Harvard, who's he's, it's about to be released and, and published. But perfectionism of the two hundred and seventy nine athletes, fifty four said perfectionism. So it was the second highest result as to why athletes fail. And I think everyone can relate to that, even, even in the workplace. So if the positive intention of the mind monster is perfectionism, it's because it cares. So how do you befriend, you know, the mind monster? Um, so that's another one that comes to mind. Reframing the story, big on story, uh, scripting before you go out and compete again before you go out it, uh, for a coach, if you've got a uh, rev up your team what's that script what is like almost like a movie script uh, where you can really inspire your your charges so they're three that that were actually just off the top of my head because yeah. I was thinking about what <laughs> what I was working with 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 people this week um, yeah but so I'm how sure is it different how, I'm sorry so how is it different working for you how is it different working with athletes versus coaches oh god you know I love I love working with anyone that really is all about seeing real possibilities beyond what they ever could have imagined. So whether I'm harnessing energy of, of an athlete or whether I'm harnessing the energy of, of coaches, to be honest, I love both. I mean, I'm a, I'm a coach at the core of my, my being, my soul. Uh, and 
while, you know, I've been coaching since I was 14. So it's always been something that I've, you know, it's, yeah, my vocation, right? So it's something that Mm -hmm. whether I'm, it doesn't matter who I'm working with. And sometimes I've struggled with that. Maybe some people can relate as well because it's not, you know, how everyone's saying, well, what's your exact target niche market, niche audience? Um, I love working with, with people that, have a growth mindset and they want to improve and they want to get better, then uh, if it's the right fit, of course, you know, I'd, I'd love to work with them. Uh, right now I'm uh, heavy, deep in finishing my book, which is called What Makes a Great Coach. And that audience is definitely for coaches. I'm fascinated on what makes a great coach. I, I bumped into Roger Federer back in 2014 and I asked him in one to a maximum of three words, what makes a great coach? And he said, someone who listens. So my book is based on the data of 500 pretty amazing coaches, 340 tennis coaches, and there's about 70 business coaches and the rest are other sports. And listening is comes in at number three. So whether I'm listening really to everything, that's so true. Isn't yeah. It? <laughs> yeah. So I want to flip my, my, can I flip that back to you both in one to a maximum of three words? What makes a great coach, Mason and Cara? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a throughout exceptionally high standards that would be my if you're gonna ask me for, for my opinion someone uh-huh. who someone who, if, if i look to a coach uh-huh. i want someone who sets exceptionally high standards i mean they they set high standards and they raise them that uh-huh. that that's probably priority number one for me uh-huh so i mean so i pointed at him because he's always the athletic one of the bunch here you know I was always on the bench and I, and I enjoyed that quite well, but I would have to really think, you know, with coaches that they actually became, um, uh, to me, and this may be crazy, but actually became as a, um, a, like a father figure or a mother figure, you know, and, and was really can touch base with you, um, uh, emotionally, um, because I think that's a huge part of it. Um, when, when, because especially when you're dealing with youth, that is a big deal and you and, and coaches lead them into what they are going to be later in life. And I think that is super important. I was going to try to build you out there. I was going to try to bail you out and give you, but that's excellent. <laughs> because she's like, but if I were an athlete, if that's was an what athlete, I would think. But if, if, well, if I, Cara, I would say a close, let, I would say a close second though, a close second would be knowledge and experience. Because if, if I'm looking to a coach, I want mm-hmm. someone who has been there and I know they understand. I know they can relate. They mm-hmm. know, because like, oh, Mike Tyson says, every, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Until you've been punched in the face, it's easy to say, oh, just dust yourself off and go do it. But until yeah. you felt the at the core of your being, right. the, 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 the absolute disgust or pain or disappointment, at, and you've put everything in and you've come up, come up short before mm-hmm. until you talk to someone who knows how painful Absolutely. that is and how disappointing that is on an yes. emotional level, not yes. just an intellectual level. Like, well, you, this is these X's and O's, you need to do this, 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 but it's much harder to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, knowledge is one thing, yeah. but without the experience mm-hmm. of, of how do I phrase that? If I have a coach and a coach mm-hmm. says, you need to do this, this, this is one thing. Mm-hmm. But when a, a true coach is one who has been experienced enough to know, Mm-hmm. that it's much harder to do those things when you have all of those emotional detachments and distractions and whatnot. Yes. Yeah. So That's Mason, on that, interestingly, uh, I interviewed Serena Williams's coach, Patrick Murray Toglu, and he said uh, someone who can hear, so hearing, hear what the player is thinking, knowledge, and he said respect and, uh, sorry, uh, results as it relates to having exceptionally high standards is the ultimate mark of respect for your athlete. So that I thought that was a, a nice tie into what you said. And of course, Cara, empathy and care come in at number four and number five in the research. So uh, there's definitely- Nice, a I made the top five. Yes, go, yes. So Perfect. I love that. Well done, you two. Awesome work. <laughs> Thank you. And that comes from somebody who was benched. So <laughs> I can only think how great I would have been if I actually <laughs> put effort into my athleticism. That's fabulous. So, 
Okay, tell us about your book again because we have to wrap it up. We're a little bit out of time. So tell us about your book and how people can connect with you, please. Yeah, so my book is called What Makes a Great Coach and it definitely will be out, uh, I was going to say the summer, but of course that's the the American winter. Uh, Around the time of the Australian Open 2022 is the goal and it's based on the research and the interviews and my podcast, which is called The Coaching Podcast. And it's uh, all the chapters are based on the top responses. So around there's listening, empathy, resilience, uh, curiosity, one of my favorite, favorite coaching words, uh, decision making. And there's a couple of chapters there, of course, on um, coaching for parents and empowering our girls. Uh, Teenage girls is is very dear to my heart. I, I run girl power camps around the world. Uh, okay. and inspiring the the next generation of, of female leaders and, and especially female coaches. I'm very passionate about mentoring other female coaches in the industry. So uh, so that's the book. I'm, I'm excited about it. And uh, yeah, it's all about what makes a great coach because I believe it's like, as we started the interview around the strength of the inner voice, there's a coach that lives within all of us. So how do we almost coach ourselves and discover our own inner coach so that you can be your biggest cheerleader, you, you know, the, the, um, the play the lead role in the movie of your own life. So, uh, so that, that's, that's where it's at. It, it, what makes a great coach.com. But if you just uh, looked up www.emmadoyle.com, .au, always remember where you come from, uh, which is AU for Australia there. Uh, you'll be able to um, find, find me there and, and uh, check out the resources um, from that website. All right, Emma, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you come back on the show another time. Thank it's you. It's been wonderful. And special yeah. thanks to our sponsor. Yeah, Syntrax Nutrition. And you can find this podcast and many others at esrshow.com. Thanks so much, and we'll see you again soon.